All right, we are now recording this meeting. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of meeting with Rona Hoffman, who is one of Chicago's most significant dealers and has been for a while. And I know Rona to be really supportive of the arts and artists and really honest and straightforward. And we can count on her to answer our questions, um, I think, with candor that will surprise you. Rona. Um, <laughs> There you go. You can you can augment your your end or correct your introduction as needed. Be my no, guest. No, that's fine. I'm I'm I was afraid that I wouldn't say anything that I wanted to, so I, I actually wrote something down, and I'll I'll read it. Um, I'll sort of ad lib it. But um, and Paul has told me a little bit about you in that he said that there are different ages and, and your careers are in different places. Uh, but I the, the biggest thing I want to start with is at the get-go is what what I have said to Paul, who says it now himself, that the art world is not a monolith. There are art worlds. And I mean, look, there are, there are different worlds in every, in every endeavor. There are different business worlds, fashion, architecture, furniture, interior designers, like price range, popularity, raw talent. Uh, and so there are the same differences among artists or people who would be artists. It all... I'm assuming also that you're driven to make art, not that you want to, but that you need to, and that, that really is, I think, what differentiates a lot of people. You're not, you don't want to just do it on the weekend when you're, when you're not working your other job. So it, it makes it a very different thing. It means you have to sell art in order to get the groceries in the house. And um, If you're, if you're aspiring to be, if you think you really are a fantastic artist, someone who is worthy of, of hanging on museum walls or really fabulous collector's houses, then you need to be in a gallery. You need to, uh, you, have to you have to get yourself somehow into group exhibitions and small places, but, but group exhibitions where, where we dealers go to snoop around and find our artists. We mostly get, or at least I do, mostly get artists from looking around or through, through references from other people. Um, don't, you, sh you really shouldn't send slides or discs or whatever to galleries unless you have actually done some homework. We're inundated, and, and most of you don't even look at the slides or discs that come in because we're really busy. Uh, and we usually approach the artists ourselves. But, if you do think that you should be in a really good gallery or a not so good gallery or whatever gallery, you still have to do some very big work. You still have to do some work. You still have to go around either on, on foot or through the internet and look at galleries and see if your art fits into their program somewhat. Because if it doesn't, there's no hope that they're going to, to ask you to join the gallery. So, I mean, I'm sure that's a drag. But, but also dragging portfolios to galleries is, is worse. So um, you can, if you really, if you find galleries where you think your work fits in their program, call them so you can get an appointment with somebody. And um, so, I, what I was really trying to say is, right, so that takes care of the people who think they really belong in a good gallery or want to be. But most artists, most artists in the world make their careers selling their own artwork, not being represented. And um, I know a lot of them, the people who participate in art fairs. Uh, and today, there's even more, there are even more places. I, I belong to a very small health, not even health club, where trainers have people who work out with them. And the one I go to, Jenny, owns it. She likes art. She has friends who are artists, and so while I'm working out, I'm looking at artwork on the wall, and she sells it. I see red dots sometimes, but people are, are, are um, selling their art in bars and health clubs, wherever people congregate now is a place to, to hang art. As I said in the beginning, I don't, I don't know where any of your careers are or what your aspirations are, and so I think rather than me going on and on and on about this, um, why don't you ask me questions and I will, as it was that I will really answer them as honestly and as fully as I can. All right, everybody's been unmuted.
Lisa, you ready? I have a question. Who's that? Aaron? Aaron? Yes. Yeah, um, Rona, how how do you gauge whether your work fits in with the gallery's program? I mean, other than just thematically or media, a certain medium or like what kind of criteria would you suggest looking at to know that? If, if you're a painter, look at the paintings and see if first see if they have if they, if they sell paintings. And then if you're an artist, you'll get a feel for whether, I mean, if, if they're a lookalike, then certainly they don't need you because they have they already have that. But if you think that you could hang your painting with your <coughs> paintings side by side with some of the other art in that gallery and it would look like a good group show, not like a sore thumb sticking out from the wall, then it's a good shot that they might be interested. But it, it shouldn't be a lookalike, but it shouldn't be so... If, if you only see um, abstract work, then they're certainly not going to look at it. And they don't want to look at your figures of work or vice versa. What, yeah. uh, what about pricing? Do you need to be concerned with how closely your prices match prices of the gallery? Um, well, there's two ways to go. Since you don't have a, since the art is stuff, you have a gallery, that means you get all the money. So you could afford, perhaps, to sell for a little bit less than the gallery, but you're still, you're still taking the money. But you shouldn't sell so low. That, um, because, look, today everyone's buying a, a painting or a sculpture asking for discounts. So you have to factor that in. And then you have to factor in how long you've been an artist and how much money you need to, you know, to do the rent. You can also tell from the resistance you're getting from buyers or potential purchasers. I mean, if you're asking $10,000 and they're looking at you like you're nuts, perhaps the price is too high. But it won't. Well, there again, I think if you if you do some work, if you go to a site like um, there a site, if you go to the auction site, or if you go to well, go to galleries in Chicago and ask to see price lists, go and ask them what you know, pretend to be a, an interested person, go around and see what they're asking for work of, of comparable size and comparable date. I don't know if that answers your question, but you can, but it should be a fair price. I mean, if you've been working for a few years, then you really shouldn't be asking for a lot of money. If you're if you're an accomplished artist who's been working for years and years, then by all by all means, you should be asking. You should increase your prices by year by year. Small. I used to get a, a used to get a phone call from Robert Mangold of the year. Telling him, telling us to uh, raise our prices by 10 percent for cost of living, in. so yeah, that is a factor. Um, How the hell have you been doing it now? Um, <coughs> I'm hearing a lot of <laughs> strange noise. It's a hard time to yeah. I have a hard time understanding too. I'm having a hard time hearing tonight, so I don't know if I should shut yeah shut down and. Yeah, I can't hear. Um, I I don't know. It might be Rona's uh, microphone. Uh, and it, it might be the microphone on the camera, which is a camera microphone situation that I lent to Rona. But I'm I'm wondering if that might have something. I don't know. And there's a beeping. Yeah, I hear that too. I, don't know. I, mean, I know I hear an echo, and I think I'm already muted, Bob. Um, I think it's uh, I hear static when I hear Rona. I think it might be on her microphone. Oh. I don't know that there's anything we can do about it. I need a new computer. Oh. No, I think it's, I think the microphone is on the camera I lent you, Rona. Oh, okay. You need a new friend. <laughs> 
Right. So how have you been going back, Erin? How have you been pricing the work? Um, it gets better now, isn't it? It's, has it been better now? or? Um. No. How have you been pricing the, the work? Oh, um, we we kind of have, like, some base prices for um, painting based on size. And then we um, – my husband does mixed media work that has um, sculptural elements. And so depending on what else he's incorporating into the painting, he'll, he'll use antique pieces and incorporate them in. So the, the that price shouldn't is, count in the pricing. Sorry, what was that? Size, size counts, but I don't think you can use a, a piece. Well, I guess you could use it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Continue. I guess it, his, his pieces vary so much from piece to piece that we have a base price and then sort of Adjust it up or down depending on you know the cost of the materials that went into it and um, the amount of you know some of, some of the pieces involved assemblage and construction work. So he'll be constructing a lot of um, pieces together. How much is a how, how much is a twelve by eighteen inch piece? Um, that's not really a common size for us. Like I would say ballpark. Ballpark. Well, what's a common size for you in, in the price? What would you price be? Well, a, I would say a common size would be um, a three by three foot. And that's how much? Canvas. And, um, but that's with the attachments incorporated. Those are in the $3,000 range. I don't see why you, you, you can't charge for everything that you put into it. I mean, I mean, if you have something that's extraordinarily different in, in, in your cost, you can add that to your production, but so are you, but are, are people buying it at $3,000? Yeah, the larger pieces are slower to move. We do a lot of smaller pieces too, and those tend to go quick, more quickly. Well, larger works always sell more slowly because people have limited space. Right. And it's more money. Um, I guess like my my earlier question, I was kind of wondering, like, in, within a single gallery, will you show artists whose work sells for eighty thousand dollars alongside artists whose work sells for much less? Um, Absolutely. Yes, we do. Yes, well, we, we do. Okay. I was just curious. Because we don't show art by price. I mean, younger artists are always less money than, than, than emerging artists, and emerging artists are less money than those who have uh, have had more years in the, in the business. Okay. I guess that, that helps because sometimes we'll go into a gallery that we might be interested in, and we see, you know, prices are much, much higher than what the level we're at, and it might dissuade us from even approaching. So that that's good to know. Hi, yes. uh, hi, hi, Rona. This is Jill. Um, one thing, I feel like I know the answer to this question, but I'm wondering because it varies from gallery or director to director. But um, for for myself, for example, I already did show um, after getting out of grad school. I had some shows. I had some momentum. Then I took some time off, really, for family. And now I'm doing work that I think is much stronger than it was before. But how much do um, gallery directors, do you feel that, that they look just, um, what percentage do you care about the resume versus the actual work? I, I prefer, the actual work is, is really more, way more important than the current work that, that the artist is doing is important. Then the resume, I think one of the, thing that is interesting but doesn't necessarily affect the decision is, is the resume to see what galleries you've already had exhibitions with, um, how long you've been showing, just, you know, interesting about your life. But it's the work itself that causes an art, a gallery, or at least my gallery, to make decisions. Do we care if you're self-taught or you've been to three universities to find? No. It's the, re the result is, is the work itself. really hard to hear. Can you hear, can, is this better if I talk like this? Might be. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. I'm really what I was looking away from the uh, 
the camera to, to see you, so I won't do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're peeking. I won't peek, okay. It also sounds like there's Morris code playing. I don't know. No, I mean, some artists start out and the work, the, the work starts out one way, and then a couple of years later, it's completely turned around, and it's, it's gotten better, it's gotten different. So um, it, it takes a long time for an artist to find, to find the, 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 to get to the mature work. Right? I agree. And I know there are some gallery directors then that really only care about the resume or, or what they hear, hear from other sources. So um, I'll try to – then it's well, trying know, to figure out yeah. galleries that actually do care about the work. You know, I know a lot of people have better ears than eyes, but um, I know what you're saying. It's, it's just too bad. How long have you been, been trying to get, or get a gallery? Um, I've been pretty, um, I don't want to say lazy, but uh, I've been focused much more on just getting the body of work done in the past year, and uh, there's been a lot of just other turmoil. So I've had representation, but I haven't in Chicago. I, I came here from Atlanta and then was in Minneapolis, oh. so there's that aspect, too, where you're moving around and you don't have relationships yet. So right. now I'm back, and hopefully with this, with Paul's help, too, that um, – I'll have better mm -hmm. success. I hope so, too. Where were you showing in Atlanta? My um, daughter lives in Athens, Georgia, so I know Atlanta pretty good. Oh, yeah. No, I I've uh, I left Atlanta about 10 years ago. So when I was there, I was um, showing in some alternative spaces, but also um, I had a, a person who's no longer doing it anymore, but she curated it. So I had a show in Centennial Plaza, which was quite nice. Um, I didn't ever – I spoke with Keon Gallery. I don't know if you know Marilyn, um, right out of grad school, but my work's very different now, so it's not her cup of tea, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it wasn't um, – I didn't have a commercial gallery other than Soho Myriad, which does hotels and corporate mm -hmm. facilities. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is that – I know there are galleries that hang out at, at graduate schools and pluck artists right from, top, right from the school, which I never do because I, I really think that it takes a while for an artist to take all of the influences they've had and, and really digest it and come out with something of their own. So um, the fact that it looks different now than it did before is, uh, is, is perfectly good. But... Um, Alternative spaces are where dealers go to find new artists. So if you and, and in Chicago now, if you go and look um, at, at the guide, I don't. I think the, or you can stop in the gallery and pick up the gallery guide, or Paul can tell you where to find it. There are far-flung small exhibition places now, some of which are really, really good. There are apartment galleries. There are just. A, Really, many, many more way, many more places in the city of Chicago that you can look and see if uh, if you like them or if they might like you. Paul, do you have that list of of, of all the new galleries? Uh, <coughs> yeah, sure. We can we can produce it. Yep. Here's a phone uh -huh. book put out by Green Lantern Press. The phone book, I think it's called. Oh. Yeah, that exists as as um. Catherine Bourne's site, um, you know, she has a whole map of everything. Um, oh, that's great. Well, get in your car or on your bike or whatever and go around and see what, they, what, what they're what they doing. True. I mean, there are lots of them. I can't, I think there are 30, 40 new, new spaces that I haven't been to. Uh, quite a few. There are quite a few. It's a little bit like what, what's happening now in the visual world is, is really wonderful. It's a little bit like the theater world in that there are lots of small venues I mean, I went to a, a play a couple of weeks ago that, in the theater that held 13 people and one recently one that held 50 people, and it was, they were for their size, they were all they were all packed. But I think um, going to see going to see all we'll, we'll get together. Paul and I will get a loose together. Maybe that's like good. I can do it pretty easily. I can do that. Good, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's impossible for someone to have somebody else to do it for them. Right. Teresa, do you want to ask a question? I don't have one immediately. You don't? Uh, 
not right this moment. All right, Jess, it's your turn then. Jess, you ready? Is that a, is that a negative? Uh, Teresa, what are you? Are you a sculptor or a painter? I'm a painter. Yes, and have you shown in galleries before? No, I have not. No. So are you? How long have you been making art? I've been making art for a long time. Um, I graduate. I received my MFA in 2007. But I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and I haven't. I haven't taken the amount of time I need to take to market myself. I've just been making for a long time. So, are there galleries in Madison? There must be. Well, uh, there's a lot of alternative spaces that are produced through the graduate school. You know, the graduate students do a lot of that. The other galleries tend to be a lot more, um, I'd say, maybe generic in their choices. You know, a lot of work that's really easily accessible to a, a population that doesn't have um, really sophisticated taste, maybe. Oh, that's interesting. You mean pictures of flowers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> flowers. Okay, thanks. Really common, you know, simple abstractions, um, landscapes, things like that are really common to see here. I mean, you get occasionally something that's different and a little more cutting edge, but it's not really common. Did you study at Wisconsin in Madison? Yes, that's where I received my what, what? Oh, why don't you go and visit people and see if they have some ideas? I mean, remember, you only need one gallery. You only need one space at a time. So um, it shouldn't. You know, it is what it's got lots of competition. There are, thousands, there are more. There the schools are are sending out thousands of students every year looking for galleries. So it, it does get harder and harder. But I think it's really really important for you to be, try to be as completely honest with yourself as you can be about where you belong. I think that's 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 really the most critical thing. Right. Rona, do you find that working with artists has changed over the because of the internet? I'm sure, look. I, I'm Julie Walsh, who has the gallery above me, and she sells a very, very, very wonderful Indian, Chinese, and other Asian country other art. And she said to me that she is selling 95 percent of her sales are over the internet. That is not that is not the case for my gallery. I think that. Uh, it, that a lot of people who are looking for art uh, are looking on the internet. You know, the art I, fair, I think that's true, but that isn't the question I was asking. The okay. question I was asking, I mean, are, are you communicating with artists much more via email than by phone? I mean, that's an obvious change, yes? Yes, of course. But every once in a while, I long for a human voice, so we talk. I mean, I mean, we, we we talk on the phone less less frequently than, than emailing because the emailing is really about business and it's a, it's a, or making a date for dinner or when, when I'm coming to New York or wherever it is. But also, uh, do you find do you find that because of the internet and the facility of communication that you you you, you represent artists differently? I mean, is there less nurturing and hand-holding going on, or is that the same amount? Well, a lot of the artists we show don't live in Chicago, so I can't hold their hand. But, um, yeah, but we've uh, always had to do that figuratively, even with artists out of town sometimes, right. you know? That's and I mean, true. and some of them don't email. I mean, some of them you need to talk to a lot, and some, I mean, has that changed? Uh, probably it has, but I don't know. I think there were different times, for instance, when you're going to have an exhibition of an artist that year, the, the tendency is, of course, to communicate more often. Sure it is. Um, but we, we work for artists even if they're not going to have a show. So today I called someone and said, so-and-so is interested. Uh, do you have anything in the studio? Da, 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 da. So, but that would be done probably depends. It's interesting. Do I just change more? Well, it's certainly easier to, to communicate with artists because of email. It's faster. Uh, 
I'm not sure. Let me have a moment to think about it. It's an interesting question. Yes, we communicate less often, actually, back and forth. But when I haven't spoken to an artist for a while, I call. And I actually tell my staff to call people because not everyone has a good to do it. Why are you asking? I'm hearing a lot of buzzing all of a I'm sudden. I'm hearing a lot now. of static too. Yeah. Is that better? Hold on. Let's. Unfortunately, if I if I mute Rona, the sound, the buzzing goes away. <laughs> so that isn't a very good solution, now, is it? Yeah. So I have to give us a speech with cue cards. <laughs> all right, you're back, Rona. Okay. Um, don't you find that you're communicating less with your friends than you used to? I, yeah, I think you have much. I think you have more communication on a much shallower level. Yes. You know, there, there's much less depth to the relationships. But I'm also wondering, Rona, if if you end up, rep, I mean, like, if you, what percentage of artists that you exhibit do you represent? Ooh, Has that okay. changed? Uh, worldwide, you know, do I represent in Chicago or the Midwest? I mean, well, I'll, how, I, do you more often yeah. take on a show that's only going to be a one-time deal? No. Like a, a, no. Except, except when we do a group show, because then we're we're not purporting to represent an artist. We're simply it's a group show, and we may we may represent them in the future, but for because I sometimes have other people curate my exhibition. It's interesting to have a different eye come in and choose. I mean, Terry Myers has done shows for me, Simon Watson, Bob Nickus, and they um, they will present me with a with a group that they like, and then I look at the photographs or I go I go see the art, and then I say, no, I don't like this, I don't like that. So, um, so I wouldn't say that they, I represent them, but Nickelodeon, I have. Nicolene and I found through a group show. Gahinda Wiley through a group show. Um, Spencer Finch, I was walking by Postmaster's Gallery in New York, and I liked it, so we represent him, definitely. We represent him. The percentage is, if we show them on a continual basis, then we represent them, at least in Chicago and the Midwest. Okay, but now what about the other way around? Are there are there artists who you will show only once without anticipating representation? Yes, occasionally, but not often. Okay. Jess, do you have questions? Can't hear you. I see your lips moving, but I didn't hear you. No, nope, I can't hear you. I don't think you have a question. I have a question. Anybody? What? My audio seems to be, is that better? I think it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Rona. Doug Froman. Um, I was interested how you, um, the, the Candy Wiley show, it's very different from the kind of work I do, but I, I found it very uh, stunning. And I'm just curious, how did you um, come upon him? Um, where did you see him or hear about him? Um, so I, in 2003, I, I asked a curator friend of mine in New York if he, was, if he had found some interesting young artists recently. And he said yes. And he brought me a list of, uh, a list of photographs of about 20 people. And out of that 20, um, I showed them much, a, a group of five, and then I went to visit Kehinde, who was on that list, and I said, let's not put him in the group show, let's give him his own show. So we gave him a show, you know, downstairs. We have, I don't know if you know my gallery, but it's back yes. there. Yes. Yeah. A big, a big space. So we gave Kehinde a, a big, uh, probably his first show, one person show, based on that uh, group show. That's how we found him. And then Nicolene Thomas, uh, we gave her very first one-person show uh, based on the fact that she was in the group show and then I and, and she was Kehinde's friend. So it was really like word of mouth. So that's how I found her, through Simon Watson and uh, in the group show. And, and how similar was Kehinde's work um, when you saw it to what you re just recently showed? 
it was much different. It was much smaller. I mean, um, but it was the same. But it, it, he had the, the same purpose for the art. It was, it was, it's always been absolutely the same. Right. He, he's never changed the idea behind the art. Thanks. Um, one other thing is within the group here, we've had a kind of a, a conversation going about, um, for lack of a better word, the artist's hand. And, and how do you feel about just your own sense in the art world today of artists um, who make their own work or maybe an artist like uh, Kuhn's or somebody? I mean, Kuhn's work obviously needs fabrication, but do you, just curious, you know, at a high level, how you feel about work made versus work produced? I don't care. Uh, I've been showing, we, we show Donald Judd, we show Saul Lewis. They do not make their art. They, right. they, 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 they think about it. They have an idea for it. They do the drawings for it, the sketches for it, but then other people fabricate it, and that's part of the idea. People, got, people are used, I'm used to it. I mean, architects design buildings, but they don't build them themselves. They have other people who are building them. And so, again, I have to keep it saying that it's, it's the result of what happens, whether it's machine-made or computer printout or whatever. I don't really I don't care about that. Right. Thanks. It's what it looks like and what it and – what, and I only like – Art that has an idea behind it. It's not art is not totally shouldn't be a hundred percent visual. There has to be something that that, is, that the artist is, is saying, communicating. Cool. What, do you, your art? Do you make your own art, Jeff? Uh, it's Doug. I do, but oh, Doug, I, I feel Doug. the same. I feel the same way. I mean, it's it's uh, the conception. I think is what excites right. me. Exactly. I saw that Tatiana wanted to say something. Tanya, what do you got in mind? Uh, nothing right now, actually. I, I heard something that can answer my question. So next time. I'll pass right now. Thanks. All right. Um, Jess, Jess I, I feel like I have an obligation to make sure we, we don't <laughs> miss anything you might want to say. I haven't heard enough of the conversation to know. Um, I've only heard about a third of the conversation. The, so the other two thirds. The other two thirds was wondering what, we, wondering what, why you didn't join us. So, <laughs> do, do you want to ask anything? If somebody came up to your gallery and they looked around and they felt like they belonged there and they wanted to talk to you about it, would it annoy you? If you wanted to talk to me about showing your work, yeah. Yeah, would. No, it wouldn't annoy me, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't get into conversation with you. You just wouldn't. Yeah. So it would be a worthless thing to do. Well, that would be because I'm probably in the middle of doing something else, and then you're just going to be an intrusion. But if you really feel that your work would look good or that it fits into my gallery, you can call or email me or email the gallery and, and write a letter saying that you really think that, that your work would be... I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I heard... Actually, now we can't hear you. I wonder what the problem is. Um, let Rona finish, and you can hear it on the recording, and I'll repeat it to you. Rona can try talking again. For me? Yeah, you. <laughs> okay. No, I, 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 it's, you, I have had people come in and do that, and you can speak to Cat or Charlotte at the front desk. And, and say that, and if I'm in a good, if I'm in, you know, if I'm not totally busy doing something else, uh, I, I certainly will talk to you. I mean, we're a very friendly gallery, most galleries are, and you just say that you're an artist and you really feel that your work would be, would, would fit in with what we're doing, and someone here, one of the three of us who are always available, will um, respond to you to send in a disc or to um, make I, it I, to I, I, I couldn't hear any of the answer. None of it. Well, let me I can't hear it. We were on that assumption, and I know you couldn't hear it, but it is on the recording, and it is 
Okay, I want to okay. add something else to it. I mean, the thing is that we sit at the gallery and we're working for the artists. We're making phone calls. We're taking care of production. We're doing. We're, we're, we're getting ready for an art fair. We're doing. We're doing a lot of things that really would require more people to do it. But galleries only have a small staff. So, um, Paul, you're going to let us hear this. Don't you agree with when you had a gallery? You're busy. You can't. You can't speak to absolutely everyone. I didn't like. I didn't like having people look over my shoulder when I was evaluating or judging the appropriateness or my response to their art. Oh, I won't and, do that. No. And, I won't and, do that. and I, 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 unlike most, I look at everything. You know, and it doesn't take long to figure out when it doesn't fit. Um, to have to answer everybody with a personal response is like w asking way too much. But that was um, how, long, how long ago was it that you had your gallery? I haven't had it since 19, uh, 2004. Okay, but the world, we, we are inundated, and then we have someone bought something that needs to be fixed. We have so many things that we're working on constantly that, um, and then if someone comes in to show me their slides, I, I agree with you. I don't want to watch, I don't want to look at artists' work while they're there. It's too embarrassing, right? I agree. It's very uncomfortable. To, to both of us, to them and, you know, to me and them. Right. But, you know, I also, don't you just think, say, can you just send me an email and, um, you know, put your website in there and I'll take a look. I'll get back to you if I'm interested. Right. On an email, better than through the mail, actually. Actually, email, I've just thought of it. Email would be a better way to contact me than, than sending anything by mail. Because we really take the discs that come in daily and we put them, we put them there and then maybe every six months we go through them. We're really, we're really busy. I mean, we, we speak to people who come into the gallery. Anyone who, want, who comes into the gallery to see an exhibition and wants to talk to someone in the gallery has, has our total attention. One of us will come and talk to anybody who comes in the gallery. We have school groups that come constantly. We, we, give, them little, we give them lectures or talks that they want to, they want to hear us discuss the, the art that's on the wall. So it's not that we won't talk to you if you come in as an artist. It's just we won't look at the work while you're there. No, I think that's only fair. All right. Um, does anybody else want to ask something? I mean, I see that Jason has joined us, <clears throat> and we could segue over to him. Does anybody have any more questions of Rona? All right, Rona, I, I learned some stuff from you already. I mean, tonight, in addition to what I've learned throughout the years. So thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. I hope it was of, I, I hope it was of some value. If, someone want, if any one of you wish to email me and, and ask me a specific question, not in public, um, Paul has my email address, or I can just say Rona, R-H-O-N-A, at rhoffmangallery.com. Just say that we spoke through Paul Klein, and I will um, respond to your email. Not a problem. Thank you very much for your time. That's very generous. Thank you. Okay. Rona, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, and um, I'll, see you, I'll see you around soon. Okay. Bye. You're welcome to stick around if you want. And now, and Jason, I'm presuming. Let's see if I can find it here. Wait a minute. Rona, I call. Yeah. Hi, artist. Hi. All right, there's Jason. Um, I think it's safe to say that the state of art criticism isn't as deep as we'd like to see it in Chicago, and that the leader, the leader in keeping it afloat, is Jason Fomberg. Oh. who I, I think does it regularly and does it honestly and does it constructively. And, oh, um, Jason, of course I know who you're talking about, in the city. Yep. Right. And um, we, Hi, Jason. <laughs> you can mute her if you want, Jason. <laughs> um, oh, he's the only good press we have in the city. Well, I feel like I can no, a little bit. Lori Lori um, and in terms of the legitimate press, um, I think I think it's, we all look to Jason. 
and I think he's constructive, and I appreciate his point of view. And he's here to um, represent all art critics everywhere. Um, <laughs> so, Jason, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thanks, Paul. That was a really generous introduction. Uh, can you? Am I on? Can you, am I too loud, too low? I can hear it. Could be a little louder, but other than that, it's, it's fine. Okay, I turned up my mic all the way. Thanks. There you go. Uh, I, w I wonder if anybody went to the to the panel discussion that was at the NCA on uh, Tuesday night with the new curator Michael Darling. Um, uh, he he gave five. Um, Five characteristics for a healthy art scene in a city and <coughs> include uh, strong institutions, good art schools, artists, of course, uh, commercial galleries, and collectors to shop at those galleries. But he did not say critics. Uh, and afterward at dinner, I had the chance to ask him about it. And he admitted that he used to be a critic before he was a curator. Uh, he sort of gave a vague excuse to me about why or how he left out criticism. Um, he seemed maybe a little bit stunned. I caught him off guard. Um, but tonight, I want and tonight and in your career, I want you to think about if you need critics in your life. Um, there, there's sort of a, there's a great quote by the critic Boris Roy. He says. He says, images without text are embarrassing, like a naked person in public. Um, for some artists, criticism is oh, it's a free marketing opportunity. And often I hear artists say that they work really hard to produce an exhibition, um, and then they install it, and then nothing, silent. Uh, it can be anticlimactic. The show is up for six weeks, and the studio is empty. Um, but I think that criticism can be a way to extend that. So um, tonight I'll just talk a little bit about what I do as an art critic and how our critics operate in an art scene. I write for New City, uh, which is a local alt weekly that's locally owned. Uh, it's been in distribution and printing weekly since 1986. I cover, I cover art, but there's also a theater section, uh, food, film, cultural news. Um, we often feature artist design covers. We have, in the early days, there was a lot of Tony Fitzpatrick. Um, Chris Ware got a lot of his early start in New City, um, publishing his comics there. We have, um, we've had a lot of different critics, but one really notable one, an eccentric guy named Michael Weinstein, who does photography criticism in Chicago. He's been doing it for New City for the past 20 years. And he, he has an eccentric practice where he will go into the show, uh, write the review on site, and then read it back to the artist. And then we print it uh, in New City. Um, me personally, I've been there for four years, um, first as a contributor for a year, and then I took up the art column, a weekly column that's called Eye Exam. And now I'm the editor of the art section and also I still write my column and reviews occasionally. Um, in addition to that, I write, I'm sometimes commissioned to do, um, uh, catalog essays for exhibitions um, from artists or galleries. I also write for Freeze Magazine, which is, if you don't know it, it's a glossy art magazine that is, uh, comes from out of London and is, uh, is distributed internationally. And I've been contributing to that since. Uh, I'm in my kitchen. Rick just turned on the football game, so uh, he's got <laughs> kind of loud. <laughs> I'm in my kitchen too, actually. Um, uh, uh, since 2007, I've been contributing to free. Um, so for New City, we do reviews, uh, everything from museums to apartment galleries. Uh, we do art news, commentary, editorial an opinion. There's sort of two types of reviews in New City. There's the kind where we talk to an artist, we do a profile on them or an interview, and then there's the kind where we don't talk to an artist. Um, we just go into a gallery and review the show and uh, have no interaction with an artist except with their art. Um, basically, criticism for me is a way to digest the art that I see uh, each week. Uh, I love New City because it's uh, it's totally independent voice and alternative magazine. 
Um, there's a division, a strong division in New City still between uh, church and state, uh, between the ad sales and the editorial. I don't talk to the ad guy. He doesn't tell me what I should write based on who bought an ad that week, and I don't uh, tell him who to get ads from. Uh, so I don't really, ha I just really don't have the compromise. I have total freedom in New City, um, and and with that freedom, I I take stock of the city's trends. Um, I try to make meaning out of what's going on in the art world here, um, sort of organize the chaos of the art scene. And I, in my column, I like to have a curatorial eye, uh, where I, um, I I take stock of uh, a few different shows that are happening and bring them together thematically. As as the editor of the art section, I have about 20 freelance writers that report to me, and uh, and contribute reviews and artist profiles. Um, some of them are artists. Actually, a lot of them are artists. It's part of their creative practice, I think, to contribute reviews. Donald Judd did it, not for New City, but Donald Judd wrote a lot of criticism in his day. Uh, it was a way for him to wrangle uh, artists that he liked and trends that he thought that were important and that he identified with. And uh, I believe that a lot, of, a lot of my artists contributors do that too. It helps them uh, understand their own practice um, and also to help formulate a theme, uh, as it were. Um, I have some I have some rules for my writers. One of them is that they never use the word interesting. That's really like the least interesting word out there. Um, I also I really I praise good writing. I love good writing. Um, I really it's, it's so common in the art world to have empty or vague platitudes in art writing criticism or in artist statements too. Um, some of my favorites, or at least favorites, I guess they would be, and you hear this sort of stuff all the time, the work is charged with tension. Uh, the, 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 the adjective critical is thrown around a lot um, without indicating what the artwork is critical of or why or how, um, or that the artist deconstructs sh social code. No idea, you know, <laughs> what that means or uh, puts our habitual way of seeing into question, <laughs> so, and so on. You know, you see these things a lot. Um, and I really, I, and I, it's a process I like to work on with my writers, is to try to really take that apart and uh, see what they mean, try to, try to understand what they mean by that, help them understand what they mean by that. And it's easy to fall into those traps of, uh, of language uh, that are just sort of given, you know, that are nodded to in the art world. Um, Another one is that I, I ask my writers to not overly describe <coughs> every artwork uh, in a group show, uh, just rather take the essence of it, of what the group show theme might be, because I think it's important to have a really readable publication. Um, it's a weekly publication that hits the streets in Chicago, so potentially any tourist or um, commuter can pick it up, um, but I don't want it to be dumbed down. Um, um, but I also don't want it to be like overloaded with art jargon, uh, sort of just to present high ideas in an accessible way. We do do negative reviews. I don't have a policy on how many negative reviews versus good reviews we do. It's just negative reviews happen. Um, if a show is bad and the reviewer is doing is reviewing it if they've asked to review it and they don't like it and they kept telling me, hey, the show is bad, I, you know, should I still write a review? I say, yes, please still write a review. Uh, there was an instance maybe about a year and a half, two years ago with a certain venue in Chicago. Uh, the gallerist emailed me and he said, hey, you know, Jason, out of the past five shows that New City has reviewed, four of them have been totally negative. And he said, maybe I'm in the wrong line of work or maybe my artists are. And I told him that I don't tell my writers what to write. And he said, well, you do decide what to publish. Uh, and so at the time, the space was getting a lot of buzz, um, a lot of hype, uh, sort of social, social cachet, I guess, their cultural buzz for it. Uh, and so my writers, they wanted to see what the space was all about, you know, what was going on there, why was there all this buzz about, about the gallery. Uh, but one doesn't really know about how one feels about a show until they go there. So the show, say, is opening Friday night, and they pitch it to me Thursday, you know, they haven't seen the show yet. Then they would email me and say, uh, 
you know, the show's action. I say, well, just be truthful. So I explained this to the gallerist, and we saw eye to eye. And now I think we've come to understand each other a bit more, and we're still friendly. Um, negative criticism. Also, people can respond on our website in comment, in the comments uh, to a review. Um, in fact, people rarely respond uh, on on our website. Um, and you know, you hear in the art world a lot that people want dialogue. But that rarely comes full circle, I find, uh, on our website. Um, most, most critics don't hear back, uh, whether they write a good review or not, from, um, from an artist. With Freeze, I don't really pitch negative reviews to them, because it's a pretty rare opportunity uh, to write for them. I don't write for them weekly like I do for New City. So um, it's a chance when I write for Freeze uh, that I can sort of increase the volume of my loudspeaker as a critic and tell the world, uh, literally, how great something is that's happening in Chicago. New City does see more neg negative reviews. I find in Freeze that they don't publish a lot of negative reviews from any critics because I think it's the same opportunity um, ar around the world for um, critics to have to say great things about stuff they promote. Uh, but New City does see more negative reviews because we publish weekly. We publish a lot of reviews and negativity uh, and, and being critical is a way to, to corral the taste. Um, it's a guide. Uh, you know, it's to guide what we believe is uh, helpful for the art scene. Um, it's not all negative, though. Uh, we publish an issue called Breakout Artists, which happens. Uh, it happens yearly and coincides with the art fair in April. And we, um, I, I've been doing it for the past three years. This April will be my fourth year where I choose just, a, just the best emerging artists in Chicago, uh, eight to ten people. Um, another difference between New City and Freeze, local publication versus international, is that with New City, um, I like to give the little guy a chance, like whether it's an emerging artist or a new space. Uh, those things are not welcome in Freeze, usually. Um, they don't have name re name brand recognition, but uh, for New City, it's a pretty no to low risk uh, venture to do either negative or positive reviews, and both are equally important. Um, uh, well, uh, another um, part of my um, I get asked to do um, uh, jury panels or, or exhibition review panels um, in Chicago, um, and those are those are really those are fun for me and a great way to learn about a new artist. One of them is the CAP, or CAPE, I guess they call it, um, grant. That it's the Chicago Art Assistance Program. So it happens once a year. It's a grant that artists, any, it's an open call for artists to apply for up to $1,000 um, for uh, their projects. And um, we met at the Cultural Center, the Chicago Cultural Center, and uh, me and maybe there were five other critics or people in the art. And we sat there all day and just reviewed slides and applications and talked about art. It was sort of a critique of art. And because of the city's open meeting act, it's open to the public. And there's sort of a peanut gallery off the side where anybody can come in, and especially the artists who are being reviewed, can come in and um, hear these people talk about their art. And uh, from what I've heard from the artists, that's a really helpful thing. Um, the artists can't speak. Um, but they sort of um, get a cold fit. Uh, as a point of difference, I'm also, I've been doing um, recently the uh, Three Walls um, solo panel, which is um, also we spend all day. It's an open call. I think that one is a $20 application fee for people uh, to apply for shows at Three Walls Gallery in the West Loop, and which is a nonprofit gallery. I think they do three shows a year, so it's pretty competitive, and um, and it's n not open to the public. The artists are not welcome to attend, and I the debate can get sort of heated sometimes. It's late in the day, we start cracking open some beers and um, debating uh, hotly artists that we think are appropriate for the coveted three spot. That that term. Um, I say for either of the K France or Three Walls that as an artist you should really apply uh, to these sort of opportunities um, because 
not only because it would be great to get a show or a grant money, but also because if you, if you don't win the grand prize, you're being exposed to a bunch of people in the arts who uh, really like art and want to support the arts, and maybe if you didn't win that day, then uh, you know maybe somebody there jotted your name down in a notebook, and uh, we'll, you'll be appropriate for some another show that they're going to be curating or, um, or or the like. Um, it feels kind of silly to say this too, but with those sort of things, you should always really follow the applications rules. Sometimes people don't, and so when there's 150 applications to go through, and somebody didn't. Uh, put in an answer for number four or drew a happy face, it's just really easy to toss that off as disqualified. Um, so uh, th that just seems so obvious, but um, it's important. I think it's also important to mention that I'm not a full-time critic. I, I have a day job um, at the Art Institute at the museum. I think like most artists, uh, you have a day job, right? Um, um, my day job, I work in uh, prints and drawings, and so it is art related, and it's a curatorial department where I deal with donors, dealers, curators. Um, I write wall labels, so I have some of my writing practice happening at the museum. As a critic who works at an art museum, though, I can never write about the Art, art Institute of Chicago. It would be a conflict of interest that I would be getting paid from both ends. Um, which is a total disadvantage to being a critic in Chicago who cannot write about the largest art museum in the city. It's, uh, it's, it's almost comically ridiculous. Um, sometimes at these sort of talks that I give, people ask me how they should engage, uh, how artists should engage with a critic. And um, I, I don't have a policy or really a preference um, about how artists engage with me, I say whatever feels comfortable for you, whether um, that's introducing yourself in person at an opening or by email is totally um, acceptable and, and welcome. Um, I do like to know everybody, everyone in Chicago who's making art and what they're making. It helps me better select the topics and the themes of, of what I'm going to write about or going to curate a show. Um, uh, in the same way, I ask that artists read the reviews uh, that people are writing about art in Chicago, to read the art writing that's happening here. It's good to be aware of um, how your peers are being received and what people are saying about art in Chicago or uh, internationally. Um, I think that there are many art worlds uh, likely the one that you're wanting to break into as an artist is biased toward art school graduates. And there's a common language. Um, that, that means that there's a common language because everybody sort of is at a, uh, ha has been through the same um, uh, process of education, I suppose. I don't think it's meant to be exclusionary. I think it's just meant to be smart. Um, I think if, as an artist, if you didn't go to art school, uh, it's important to get involved in that common language, uh, whether you're reading or, or reading a, about art or writing about art yourself, uh, maybe for a blog. Um, and I think it's super important as an artist to talk to people about art. That can also be a form of art criticism. Um, personally, I don't review exhibitions that take place in cafes or restaurants or bars or street fairs but I do review art shown in basements and garages and people's apartments. And I, is that contradictory? Probably yes. But I think we're looking for a certain professionalism, a sort of standard degree of professionalism. Uh, cafes and bars have a track, rec track record of not showing really challenging art. And as a person, as an art writer, I like to be challenged. Um, I don't like easy art. I like to be pushed hard by art. Um, that being said, I do like to be entertained by art. I think a lot of people would admit that, that they want to be entertained. Um, I also, I love to do studio visits with artists, and and um, I like when I do a studio visit that the artists show me everything that they're working on, from sketchbooks 
to working ideas and even mistakes. And I think it's especially important with studio visits that um, that, that people follow up with me uh, maybe three or four months down the line and say, you know, here's the thing that, uh, remember the thing I was working on in the studio, here's, here's images of it completed. Uh, I think it's when we do the studio visit, it can be a beginning of a relationship. I believe that critics want to champion an artist. Um, when I started as art editor about three years ago at New City, there was a perception in Chicago that it was criticism was really flat and dead. So it was an uphill battle to get people involved in criticism again and sort of invigorate art criticism. Um, and I do it for the health of the city's art scene. I feel like that as an art writer, I'm, hel I'm helping fill a void. Um, in my writing, I, and in my writer's writing, I, I encourage them to talk to other publications uh, through the writing and say, you know, so-and-so critic said this, well, is that right? Should we discuss what that really means? Um, I think it's part, of, it's part of building a conversation or starting a conversation and then building uh, a record of of conversation. Um, ultimately, I think because New City, New City uh, in this age of uh, 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 digital, you know, ever expanding digital content, that um, print publications are certainly being challenged uh, in their existence. But um, New City is taking a bit of a risk, and we're publishing longer reviews, longer articles. Um, uh, longer than longer than I think online people there was a study that people like to read people can max out online reading an article that's like 500 words in print we're experimenting with running multiple ar uh, articles that are 2,000 words in length or more um, we New City believes that our readers like to read and I like to write so I'm going to keep doing it um, and I would love to take questions too Cool. cool. Um, I don't know. I don't feel like I haven't picked on Johanna enough. Johanna, do you, want, do you have a question? Sure. Um, uh, Jason, how do you decide which, which um, shows to review and stuff? Pretty organic. I I um, I get a lot of press releases in my email, um, and I look at a lot of them. It's not too hard to take stock in a couple hours digitally or on the art listing sites of what's going on in Chicago. Um, and then I build an assignment list for my writers. And then um, I go out and see shows on the weekends. And uh, I decide usually once I get there if it's something clicks uh, or if it doesn't. Um, I decide if the work, I decide to write about it if the work engages me, if it clicks with something I'm feeling in my life at that time or um, uh, something I understand that's happening across uh, multiple artists at that time. That's, that's something that really clicks with me is if I, if I see something that um, a lot of artists are doing simultaneously, um, if there's a sort of pattern emerging. No. So it's it's really organic for me. How pure is it for you? Because you know when I do an art letter, it isn't particularly pure. Um, you know, if somebody's a friend, I'm prone to finding a nice the ability to say something nice. Um, do you are, are you can you can you confess to that? I I usually don't write about my, I I as a rule I don't write about my friends, my very close friends, and that means I'm a bit of a loner. <laughs> <laughs> that means I don't have a lot of artist friends. I have a lot of artist acquaintances. Um, but, you know, the critic kind of is roams alone sometimes or often. Um, if, if there's a good friend who is having a show, I'll put their, I'll put their show on my assignment list for my, for my writers just alongside any other show and hope that it gets taken. Um, I don't. I try not to give special consideration. Um, my friend. Is everything that gets written about get published? Sorry. 
Does everything that gets written about get published? No, it doesn't. Um, if one of my writers sends me a review and we pass it back, back and forth a few times and we can't agree on a revision, it won't get published. Okay, but they're typically not flat out rejected. What's that? They're typically not flat out rejected because you disagree with what's said, or I don't know what else. No, I, I, if I, if I, if I also saw the show and I disagreed with how with what the critics said, um, I would still publish it. I would try to help them refine their voice or refine uh, their argument. And make it, you know, um, air, airtight. But um, I, I wouldn't reject it just because I think that they're being mean to an artist that I like. And in fact, that happens often. But I will reject a review if I feel that the writer is not responsibly engaging the art, if they're being cruel, or if that the writing is. Um, Totally off base. Right. Do you do you try to make a priority of covering Chicago based artists? Yeah, New City is well, New City is a Chicago based publication, but we cover anything really that happens in the city. The longer articles I do try to make a priority of Chicago based artists. Um sort of I think it's important to tie them back into the scene and explain why they matter here. Um, but also, it can be really helpful, I think, for people to not always hear about the same artist. Because Chicago art scene can, can seem kind of small sometimes. Uh, and so if you start reading about the same artist over and over again, it's sort of, why bother reading it, you know? So if somebody's coming into town from Kansas City or uh, from Denver, it can be a great opportunity to try to tie that person's practice into what's happening in Chicago. No, I totally agree. Yeah. And I think that's the way that will help Chicago's art scene in total rise uh, in, in prominence in sort of the network of what's um, the network of art practices. Okay. Jess, do you have a question? I have two. Who do you read? Right. What what critics do you read? When you who do you admire as a critic yourself? I'll be honest. I mostly read fiction. <laughs> I I love to read, and the majority of what I read is uh, fiction because I love I love the fantasy of just I just love good writing. I also read um, totally devoted New Yorker reader. I I think the New Yorker does a great job of and I think that art writing can um, can mirror this, is that they will expose you to topics that you really had no idea that you cared about, and they will um, expose it in depth. Uh, hopefully, I think I, I use that as a model for my writing and others um, in that if somebody could pick up an art review and read it and not having seen the show or not even an image of it, can they connect with it and um, identify with what's going on in the show and perhaps learn something about art or about the world at large through an art review? What fiction oh. are you reading? Um, what am I reading? Right now, well, I just picked up Zola's The Beast Within, but I haven't started it. That's sort of not answer. That's that's fine. Uh, my other question is: Is there something you love? Is there something you go out and you think, "Oh, I hope I see that." That's a hard question. I, I um, I, it would be a not. It wouldn't be a tactile quality. It would be something an abstract uh, quality that I would hope I would encounter when I go out and see art. I think it would probably be, you know, when 
I, I don't know. Maybe it's something outside of words. I like to be confounded a lot. I like to approach a problem in art. Sometimes I see something that I totally dislike. And, you know, sometimes those things are the things that stick in your head and that you keep coming back to. And for whatever reason, it is so weird in a good way. And it just will, like, after you keep thinking about it, or if you see it a second or third time, that um, it becomes—it's like a—it's like a pop song, you know. Like if you hear a pop song, then you pop song that you instantly like, or a painting that is instantly great um, on impact, you know, it, it tires easily. But something, something, rub you the wrong way. Uh, I feel like that, like the Ray Yoshida show that's up now is such an amazing show, but some of the paintings are so bizarre and awkward that it took me a long time to look at them and understand what about them, like, so radical. Um, it's not instantly likable. And I think that that can be sometimes a fun challenge with art, is that you're not always gonna get it. Uh, at the first go. So you've changed your mind on things before. Yeah, it, it's some. You know, I I think I caught the tail end of what Paul was saying with Rona is that it takes it often takes just an instant for you to uh, for you to understand what you like and what you don't like or what fits into your program of your galleries of what. It's into your program of, of life. Um, as a critic, I'm, I don't have to have the 10 artists that I show in my stable, so I can try to be open to things that I, that I don't like. And I've even published negative reviews or uh, things that later I will come around to maybe months later and say, wait, now I understand that. Um, now I get that. Another person. I think Bob's trying to say something. <clears throat> you do? Yeah, he's making a gesture. <laughs> he is? Yeah. All right, Bob, we're going to unmute you. All right, Bob, you have the floor. He didn't want to talk. Bob. <laughs> I have a question. Steve, who is that? Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Is negative review even better than no review? Like, is it better just to be talked about even though, you know, it's negative? I mean, at least you get some kind of your That's name a hell of a good question. That's a, have you ever been asked that before, Jason? I haven't, but it is something I've thought about. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I don't know if anybody watched covers or anyway. Okay, thank you. Jason and... Wait, 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 uh, Bob, 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 wait, 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 wait. I'm muting Bob. We're, we're going to make him wait. All right, because somebody else started a question when you didn't, and we'll get back to you, Bob, momentarily. I hope you're still there. Okay, Jason, go ahead and answer Tanya's question. Okay. question is, is negative review better than no review? There's something so great that Michael Kors said on Project Runway, which whether or not you like reality television, they do really great crits of fashion on there. Uh, they're so spot on. One of the judges said, no review is the worst review. And I think that, like what I said at the beginning, in that sometimes when you do an exhibition and it's just sitting there for six months and your studio is empty, you know, what happens next if you're not at a commercial gallery, especially, and you're not expecting sales? Um, no review can mean possibly that nobody cares. A negative review. A negative review takes time to write. It doesn't, it takes time to sit down and write something, whether it's two hours or maybe it's been brewing in your head all day. And I personally won't write a negative review unless I am totally pissed off. And, uh, and that means I'm passionate about defending something. Um, and that's when I'll write a negative review. Artists hate negative reviews. Uh, they take it totally personal. Um, but from a critic's perspective, a negative review means that 
I'm trying, I'm not talking about you personally as a person or how you raise your kids, but about um, this sort of bigger thing uh, of, of art, uh, this, this communal goal. Okay, now, Bob, don't, don't, we haven't turned you on yet here, Bob. Um, we're going to let Bob talk. Bob, try. <laughs> no. Bob, go ahead and speak, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a chained dog. It's like you have to put him on the leash. And <laughs> oh, Bob, I'm sorry. This isn't working right. Bob disappeared. His picture's gone. <laughs> oh, I see his picture. Oh, I don't see it moving. Yes, I'm here. There I'm he here. is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Good uh, speech. Quest okay. The question I have uh, for Jason, uh, early on in his presentation, or your presentation, Jason, uh, you mentioned about images without text are embarrassing, sort of like being naked in public. Is that the uh, – are you referring to the critical text by the critic, the reviewer, or – the artist or the curator, and where did that fall in place when you look at an artist's website? Yes. Well, first of all, that wasn't, I didn't, that was a, a quote from somebody else. And hold on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute Bob and then we'll let him you. talk again when you're done. Okay, Jason. Okay, well, first of all, that was a, that was a quote from somebody else that I, uh, that I liked, that I enjoyed. Um, and I, I believe that the writer said that because, um, you know, usually in a, in a gallery's binder, there is a written statement or artists are, are encouraged to, to do an artist statement. Um, there's wall labels at museums. Um, the only time you find artwork out in the world that doesn't have written text um, is if the, if, if maybe one of two things, if the presentation is totally unprofessional, or if it's art that um, is often not—it's often a commodified experience um, to, to engage, to to encounter art that has text. So, if it's like a social practice or public art, it's not going to have text, right? Um, and then, in that way, maybe it should be naked. Um, I do think that it's helpful for an artist to work on an artist statement, not so other people can read it, but for their own practice. As a writer, I don't usually read artist statements unless until after I've written what I want to write. I don't read press releases until after. And if, um, unless I'm responding to some larger critical debate uh, about um, some articles that I've read. Um, I won't read about what's previously been written about an artist, especially if it's a very established artist that's had a lot of press. Um, and I already know that they're going to say that such and such artist responds to uh, her um, lesbian identity or whatever as a Mexican American dealing with border issues if I know that that's the critical debate currently happening with that artist, I'm going to try to push against that if I'm interested enough to write an article and try to write something, find something new in that artwork. Um, so while I encourage an, uh, writing to accompany artwork, and I, in a museum, in a museum context, I usually will read the wall panels because I'm interested to, to see how, you know, you usually know the art in museums very well. It's one permutation of Donald Judd or another. I'm interested to see what the curators are thinking about or what sort of presentation they're offering. So that's sort of a multi-layered answer. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if Bob has a follow-up for that. Um, Bob, you get to speak some more. Thank you. Uh, the follow-up question, Jason, has to be where does writing and what kind of writing has its place on our nurse website? On a website? I 
I think if I'm encountering art on a website, I want to read something that is non-traditional. Um, I want to I want to see something maybe experimental, uh, maybe some creative writing that can accompany the artwork. If there's, if there's an artist statement, that's fine. You know, that's pretty typical and accepted. Um, if the artist likes to write, I would like to see something unusual that could perhaps, um, that sort of writing I will read before I write about the artist. Have you ever have you ever written anything? Um, have you ever been paid to write anything that you well you didn't particularly care for what you wrote about? I mean, you're, I didn't say that well. Have no, you I, have you been more effusive and gotten paid for it than you think was warranted? <laughs> Certainly, uh, you know, writing is not only something I do because I love it, but it's also I realize it's a skill. So I've been paid to write about artists. There's only been one instance where I absolutely hated the artwork and the fee was ginormous and I said yes. And it was for their press materials, so I didn't have to include my name on it. Oh that was, that was that's good. I felt comfortable doing that. If it was a catalog and I had to sign my name to it, I would feel a little bit worse. A little bit, but you probably would have done it anyway because it was ginormous. <laughs> you know, it's not bad to make money. No. No, no, no. And we all have our price. Yeah. Um, all right. Do we have other people who ask, would like to ask? Sarah, we haven't heard from you tonight. Do you have something to say? I'm going to take that as a no. She's, her mouth is moving. Yeah, her mouth is moving. Wait a minute. Why is her mouth I can't moving? can't hear you. All right. Move your mouth again. Hello. There. I don't really have, like, a big meaty question, but I was wondering, you know, when you write a negative review and you get these artists that are so close to their work, do they really, do they contact you? Do they email you? Do you get, like, backlash from artists that are angry? Sometimes. I usually, the most I hear from an artist is if I spell their name wrong uh, or if there's a factual error. But an overly negative review Usually the only way I hear about it is if I see it on Facebook, if they're complaining, or um, Twitter maybe. But usually no, they won't contact me. But you know what, Whoa. I wish they would. Why? I wish they would uh, start, a, start a conversation because if I personally have written a negative review, then then I feel, like I said, I feel impassioned enough to spend my time talking about it. But, you know, most people don't like being gossiped about or, and then if your name is out there in publication for everybody to read and it's something negative, I understand that that could be totally hurtful. And so, you know, uh, I take that into consideration. <laughs> Do you also feel like, Jason, that you don't get enough response regardless to what you write? Yeah, and I'm not necessarily looking for, if I write a great review, I'm not necessarily looking for praise for somebody to say, oh my God, you know, you really have saved my career or that was meaningful. You know, that feels good too, but I would like, if I'm, if I'm writing something, I would like uh, the artist, it would be great for the artist to follow up and say, you know, that's interesting. That's not really what I was thinking about. Or um, here's what I was thinking about. Or here's another way to think about it. Um, or whatever. I have a question. Yeah, Vicki. You have a certain aesthetic that appeals to you. Do you um, make sure to have uh, other critics maybe working with you that have the opposite end of the spectrum kind of uh, aesthetic so that you have a fair and balanced kind of group of people that do reviews or is it all kind of like the same kind of you know because if, if you have one point of view or about aesthetics then it's kind of limiting but if you have many people with different so c you could send out different people depending on what kind of work it is that's a great idea um, 
to be honest, I don't think that criticism is fair and balanced all the time. It's it's one person writing about another person's uh, art, and it, it, it's often very personal uh, at taste level. Um, it's something that I've talked about with other critics, doing a sort of a conversation. And I've done it in the past, but it's been pretty rare where I print a sort of a dialogue. It's something maybe that can be better formatted toward um, a live conversation or a podcast, you know, um, in print. Well, in print. I guess I meant working where you're working, if you have like a certain, let's say a, a press release for a show that comes in and it's not your particular, you know, cup of tea, but you know that this critic you have working for you really likes that stuff. Do you send that person out or? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't think that for New City, it's just my taste. Whatever my taste is, that's what goes. Um, there's some, I have some writers that review things that I I wouldn't even want to go to the gallery to look at it. It's very traditional or, it's, you know, figure studies or, and I know that this writer absolutely loves that thing and he can get really into that. I say go for it. I think, you know, there's a lot of different art worlds in Chicago. There's not just, there's not just one or two, but there's, there's many. Um, I think it's good to cater to all those or represent all those. It'd be nice if there were other people covering various niches in the art world so that you could specialize more, but that isn't the case and it doesn't look like it's going to be soon. I don't understand what you said. I'm just saying it'd be nice if there were other, I mean, if the Tribune, for example, had more art criticism and or Sun Times covered everything that was pre-1940, for example, and you could count on it, um, but it isn't going to happen. You know, that would make a really strong publication that people can really believe in is, is if it was super focused. Um, that's why people like to read, you know, specific trade journals or whatever. Um, you can count on that publication that it's always going to be covering that certain thing. And that's exciting in a certain way because you can go a lot deeper, whereas a uh, publication that the beat is the entire city of Chicago, we're more wide than we can be deep, although we try to be deep. But um, yeah, it would be great. Uh, and sometimes um, publications do bubble up or blogs bubble up that are super focused say there'll be a blog on public art in Chicago, or there will be a blog on, um, or a, a, public, a zine on conceptual practices in Chicago, and those can be super riveting. Um, because I write for an all weekly, we, I, I don't think we can really be that focused and still be relevant because we publish weekly. Um, no, I agree. But it would, be, it would be nice if there was more if there was more exposure to the arts through criticism. What kind of uh, what kind of arts are not being covered in Chicago? I don't think an, an awful lot of art by people of color is getting enough exposure to an, a non people of color audience. You know what? I don't I don't uh, assign reviews based on color. No, but you're probably not looking at the South Side a lot either. You know, I don't look too much at um, Bronzeville. Or I know there's a number of galleries in Bronzeville, yeah. and I, I don't go there uh, because uh, I don't personally respond to the art that's being shown. Uh, and I've been disappointed by the art that's being shown there. It's not really challenging for me. It, it, in, it often can just become um, promotion of a certain identity and not, not doesn't become about the art. Um, but that being said, there are, I think that, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of artists of color, Asian, Latino, African American, uh, and I don't really have like a, a checklist, you know, that we covered this many that month or whatever. I, I, I sort of think that I I like to believe that I'm that we're past that that we don't have to say 
we didn't cover enough women or gay artists this month, and next month we have to try harder. I think that the field has been flung wide open. Um, perhaps there are other biases in the art world, maybe galleries uh, that don't show enough artists of color, and that's why there are galleries in existence that only show artists of color uh, to compensate or overcompensate for that. Um, I think Chicago, New City is, <coughs> is widely circulated um, on the South Side and um, has a sister publication called the Chicago Weekly that's um, part of the University of Chicago uh, has a huge presence on the South Side. I think about, in terms of not appreciating or understanding a different aesthetic, I think it's okay to bring in a different eye and someone who does appreciate that aesthetic um, if it reflects a significant uh, part of one's constituency or a constituency that one seeks to appeal to. I mean, I grant you that a lot of the art that I see in Bronzeville I don't respond to as much as I see or do art elsewhere, but I think it's of sufficient quality that it's worth having somebody look at it for me and say, you know what I mean? I'm not positive, and or maybe it's just bad, but I'd like to give it a yeah. shot. Uh, I also, I'll also tell you that most of my writers for New City, I don't know them in person, that I only correspond with them by email. So I don't, aside from the cue of what their name is, I don't know what their ethnicity is. Um, I certainly encourage my writers to hit up art scenes in Chicago that are outside of the West Loop or River North, um, because those are so covered. Those are covered way too much. And um, to be honest, uh, when I, you know, I don't think those galleries even care often. When I I just met Rona uh, last week, and she, uh, I don't think she's reading New City. I don't think she cares. And you know, what? New City has been covering like every show she's ever done. What's the point? It's like I said, New City has pretty low to no risk. We can cover whatever's happening in Pilsen. Um, but my writers are the ones are, who are also deployed on the ground, and and it's also up to them. I don't make an effort of hiring artists uh, who are minority. I mean, uh, writers who are minorities. Interesting. Okay. Johanna, doesn't that make you want to ask a question? Um, well, I actually, um, Jason, I, it's nice to meet you. I actually um, sent a press release to you <laughs> that long ago. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm glad to hear that you sort of welcome that kind of thing because I was really embarrassed to send it. You know, I was sort of nervous that, oh, this might be interpreted, whatever. But um, anyway, I... You know, and um, I, I like, I'll certainly, I certainly look at press releases, but you know what's even better than a press release is if you put, like, in the subject line, hey, Jason, I'm having this show, and then in the, sub, and then in the, in the email has the specifics of the show and maybe, and, and a couple images. That is super helpful to me, and that will, like, increase the chances that I'm going to open the email and read it, because, um... I'll be, I get a lot of press releases. I think a little a little personal touch. It's good to be totally professional, but a little personal touch is also really helpful. Do you pay much attention to snail mail anymore? I uh, for New City, um, I never go in the office. Um, I don't have to, and so when people send mail there, sometimes I get an email from our publisher, and he's like, "Hey, your mailbox is overflowing." And I know that there's stuff in there from uh, last March, so uh, I usually just say, hey, you know, can you trash it? <laughs> unless, it's like a, unless it's a nice catalog or something somebody sent me, but yeah, snail mail is totally not happening. How, how far in advance do you want to receive information? At least two weeks. <laughs> Especially for a show that's happening for one night only. Interesting. Okay. 
Anybody else? Tatiana, I still see your hand is up, but you don't, that, you don't, you, you're oh, already. Oh, that was old. <laughs> yeah, old. I thought so. Yeah. Old hand. Old hand. All right. Well, Jason. I just know one thing. All right. Yes, what, Vicki. What, do you, any of your, your critics that are also artists get flack for, for being visual artists that are reviewing? Because I know, like, in theater, sometimes theater critics get flack if they're playwrights or actor wannabes or something like that. Do they get that, like, do they get flack from people like artists, especially if they get a bad review? Oh, they get respect. Is that humor? No, I find that they totally get respect for it. Do you find the opposite? Are you asking me? Or yeah, asking or anybody. No, I, don't ask me. I don't know the answer. I, I think that, you know, you know, uh, uh, flip side of that question is a lot of artists ask me if I'm an artist as well. They want to know if I am credible enough to judge their art, if I've made art. I find that to be a really um, difficult question. And I think, um, again, on the flip side, more of your question, it's, I think it's really good for an artist to write. Um, they're not doing it because they want to know, defeat their foes or their enemies, but because they want to better understand how they fit in. And um, the artists that I know who write, from what I've seen, is helpful um, to their careers. Um, sometimes it's a token gesture for a critic to be an artist or an artist to be a critic. And sometimes it's, it can be pretty profound. It's, it's just an easy way to write write off if you get a negative review. I've I've just people use as a as a uh, you know what I'm trying to say, right? <laughs> to dismiss a negative review, I guess. That it's a personal vendetta or something. They're not personal. I just think that like I've heard I've heard like someone get a negative review and then they dismiss the critic that way instead of maybe taking the review in for anything that might actually be helpful. Yeah, I've not experienced that. I can understand that. Hi. I had a, I had a quick, uh, quick question, Paul. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Jason, uh, I think this has been terrific. I've never really heard from a critic. I only know one other critic, and so I think this is really great. Um, I'm just curious, um, not just uh, Chicago, but around the world, any art, uh, just two or three artists who, you're, who are sort of on your radar right now, maybe younger or not necessarily young in age, but in career, but just a couple of artists that you're excited by and why, just real high level, real quick, any, from anywhere. Um. I'll tell you, I, love, I really love, I can really love and support Carol Jackson, who's working in Chicago. I think she, um, I think she always astounds me with what she makes, and it's always super weird in a great way. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a comic artist, but I love Ross Chast, because I think that she's, um, she can really get to the heart of uh, human tragedy in a funny way and a really pithy way and her drawings are um are wonderful to look at um i don't know you know to be honest i'm not i'm not uh i don't always have artists on tip of my tongue like that um i sort That's of okay. I, I sort of go through um i sort of move too fast sometimes Okay. That first person was, what was the first name? Cal? Oh, that's Carol Jackson. Carol. Okay, thanks. What was the second one? Roz Chats, who writes, uh, well, comic, comedian, or um, cartoonist in The New Yorker. Yeah, yeah. R O Z. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, all right, never mind. You know, those, that's, not the, that's not my gospel. I mean, I, the funny thing is, is I write every week and every week is like the thing that I love. I mean, Ooh. this week, oh my God, it's Ray Yoshida. Like, how can you, like, that's 
who I want to see every day right now. You know, I want to go to that show every day. Um, but next week it'll be something different. I'm curious. You, a couple times you said things that you get passionately angry about. Well, what pisses you off? Well, I don't like a show that poses as a really serious intellectual show that is um, that's, that's, that's a total joke that's based in jokes. Or, um, for instance, um, the Richard Lund Prince. Richard Prince that I have no feeling for. Because um, there is none. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's totally. Um, whatever the show is at the Renaissance Society right now, I think it's Rebecca Warren. It is. Uh, total lack of craft and um, and insight into um, her, her profession, and I don't think she takes seriously what she does or her position. Um, often it's contextual, such as Rebecca Warren, who is at the Renaissance Society, which is now only doing three shows a year, and I think she really spoiled her opportunity to um, to wow Chicago, and uh, so that one is contextual. I mean, if I saw that art at somebody's apartment, I wouldn't even probably have no feeling about it. But yeah, you know, that's funny, but uh, because where it is, uh, who's, uh, who's supporting it, that, that, that can kind of piss me off. Um, this is Erin. I have a question. Um, you had mentioned the uh, the breakout artist section that you do for uh, New City once a year. Yeah. Um, I saw that last year. I, I was just curious, um, is there a selection process for that, or is it kind of just a subjective thing, just artists who come up a lot, or how do you guys select those artists? The first year that I did it, um, I write the whole thing, and the first year that I did it, it was subjective, and didn't have a focus. The second year, I decided that going forward that I would have a theme, uh, some rules for myself. And that second year, I decided that the theme of that record artist issue, um, this was 2008, no, I'm sorry, 2009, that they would be artists who had expanded practices outside of the studio who were running parades or galleries as art, um, that sort of thing. And then, then the third year, it was the first year that, which was this year, um, it was the first time that we had an exhibition component with the issue, and it was at Art Chicago, so I decided to have artists that were really strong image makers or made really good objects um, that could be encountered at the art fair, you know, um, and I understood in a split second, not understood, but you know, it could draw people in, have a bit of a wow factor, conceptual or expanded practices didn't really fit in there. Uh, so I think I'd like to um, continue, um, try to thematically draw the artists together. Okay, every time I say okay, somebody else chimes in with a question. Okay. <laughs> All right, Vicky, you got a question? No. Nope. All right. Um, Jason, thank you very much. Thank you for your input. Thank you for your insights. I appreciate it. Um, everybody else, thanks to you also. I think it's been a good evening. And um, 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 whoa, I see you all again on Monday again, I guess. I look forward to it. Um, and I'll see you on Campfire, too. Thank you all very much. Good evening. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.